the farther you go, the darker it gets. The woods are the kind of place you don't want to venture too far into, because when you step foot in the deep woods, there may be no turning back. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter, or I guess it's called X now or something, at Dark Prevails. If you want to help me figure out whether Redwood Bureau or Tales from the Break Room would make a better manga series. Today I've got a set of brand new and scary deep wood stories. Enjoy, and don't forget to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Before we start, I'm trying to revive my old interview series, In the Woods. If you haven't heard of it, it was just a talk slash interview show where people with bizarre experiences in the woods call in and I interview them, discussing their experiences and beliefs. I won't be the host if it comes back because I don't have the time, but I am trying to see if Jin Sin will be able to host it instead. That being said, we need someone to interview, so if you're over 18, have a decent mic and you have a strange, creepy, and very believable story about something that actually happened in the woods or outdoors, join my Discord with the link in the description and let us know you want to be interviewed. Thank you. Now, let's begin. What I shot was not a deer. From Tank 2499. I was born and raised in the southern United States, a part of Louisiana to be exact. Skills like hunting, fishing, camping, and even bushcraft were taught to me by my father and grandfather from a very young age, so it made sense I always wanted to be doing something outdoors. When I was about 17, I had decided I wanted to go on a solo bow hunting trip. Nothing major, just one night at my camp and one full day of hunting. So I packed up my gear, told my folks what I was doing, and made my way out into the woods. We don't live all that far from the woods, and where I usually hunt, I would normally just walk instead of having to use gas and drive there. This time was different. Something told me to bring my truck. I'm not sure what it was, maybe just instincts, or maybe it was the amount of gear I was bringing along, and I simply didn't want to deal with all that for a few miles. I'm not sure. Something told me I needed to have my truck, and looking back on it, I'm certainly glad I decided to drive. So I get down to my camp about 6.15. This is in mid-December, so it's basically dark by this point. I had just enough light to find a good parking spot, then I had to use my flashlight the rest of the walk in. I'd made it to the camp about 6.35. After I parked, I had to walk, because the woods are too thick to drive through the rest of the way. Eventually, I made it to my camp. I set my gear down, and right away, I started gathering tinder and firewood. I pitched my tent, positioned all my gear in a way I could just grab it and leave the following morning. That way, I wouldn't be stuck looking for something. Then I pulled out a can of beans, some sausages, and I started dinner. That night was quiet. Not ominously quiet. I could still hear the different noises one would hear in the woods at night but as I said, nothing that would keep me awake. After eating and just relaxing, I got comfortable on my sleeping pad in my tent, and I drifted off to sleep. I woke up to absolute silence somewhere between 2 o'clock and 2.15 in the morning. Earlier, when I mentioned ominous quiet, this is what I meant. If you've ever spent much time outdoors or in the wilderness, you would know what it's like to experience this kind of quiet. A kind of silence that makes your heartbeat sound like it's right beside your ear. Experienced outdoorsmen know that this quiet almost always guarantees danger. I sat in my tent, my revolver in hand, waiting. Then, about 40 yards in front of my tent, I could hear twigs snapping. I heard heavy and what seemed like bipedal footsteps. It's not uncommon for other people to hunt these woods, but I was certain I was the only one who would be out here. I mean, this property belongs to my immediate family. Any other person who wanted to hunt had to always get permission, and even if that were the case, my father would have let me know that someone else would eventually show up. Something felt off about this. 
I slowly raised up, unzipped one of the windows in my tent, and I looked towards where I heard the footsteps. But as soon as I did, nothing. The night went right back to how it usually was. Crickets, birds, all those nighttime noises. I convinced myself what had just happened may have been caused by being half asleep and half awake. I managed to fall back to sleep not long after that. I'd convinced myself that my mind was just simply playing tricks on me, and that put me somewhat at ease. I awoke to my alarm on my phone, set for 5 a.m. It was time to get up and make the two-mile trek through the woods to my tree stand. I had timed it to where I could get up, grab my gear, walk the two miles to my stand, and make it just in time for sunrise and first shooting light. I grabbed all my gear, not double-checking anything because I told myself it was all good from the night before, and I left. Not double-checking my gear would prove to be a pretty big mistake. At this point, I'm about a mile deep into the woods, and I only have one more mile to go until I made it to my stand. As I'm walking, I can hear something in the woods off to my right. If you can picture a small path through the woods, with woods surrounding both sides of it, that's what I was walking through. At one point, I stopped and crouched, waiting for whatever it was to emerge from the forest into my view. Wouldn't you know it, a white-tailed buck came walking out of the woods. It was a bit odd-looking, though, but nothing that made me not think I could bag him. When I say odd-looking, I mean he was rather skinny, and his eyes looked almost blind. But he was acting like a typical deer, walking, grazing, popping his head up to check his surroundings. His walk, though, his gait, it weirded me out a lot. It was almost as if he was drunk, stumbling, moving in an atypical way, bobbing side to side and walking with a limp. As the sun came out more and more, the deer got closer, and I was able to get a better look. I could tell he appeared sick. He stank. The smell was terrible. He was far skinnier than I initially thought, and he was discolored. His antlers were a shape I've never seen on a whitetail. Honestly, while I was looking at him, bagging him as a trophy and to feed my family wasn't even my concern anymore. I just wanted to put him out of his misery, in the poor thing's pain. So I decided to do just that. Here's where double-checking your gear, even if you think it's all good, comes into play. I had a sling quiver for my arrows, so I wore it on my back. It was just easier for me to reach back and draw an arrow. The day before my hunt, I told my brother he could use some of my arrows to practice his shooting. Well, unbeknownst to me at the time, when he'd put them back in the quiver, a few of the broadheads were facing up. It was a simple mistake, but one I never noticed. I was more focused on getting to camp and actually going hunting, so I didn't notice that the arrows were upside down in my quiver. Anyway, I reached back to draw an arrow, and my thumb caught the blade of one of the broadheads, slicing my thumb wide open. Of course, this makes me kind of shout, Ow! Ow! And when I did this, I was certain the deer was going to be scared off. But I heard no trotting footsteps, no grunts, nothing to indicate the deer had left. Instead, what I heard was a drawn-out and distorted, Ow! followed by a deep, guttural growl. I looked this supposed deer right in the eyes as I watched it stand onto hind legs and stare into my soul. It bared teeth, which were yellow, not too long, but very sharp. Fear put me in a trance that essentially left me paralyzed. I could not move. Maybe I just didn't want to terrified that moving would cause the thing to come after me. My fight or flight kicked in, and I'd quickly reached back, grabbed an arrow, knocked it, and sent it flying right towards this beast. It struck it low, but what would have been fatal to a normal animal proved to be nothing to this thing. 
I knocked another arrow as this creature started to quickly make its way towards me. I released. This time, I seemed to pierce it in the side of the neck. It screamed this awful scream, then turned and ran off the other way. I watched it go from this bipedal atrocity to running on four legs like a deer once again. It got a pretty good ways into the woods, and I saw it stop. It then turned around and looked at me with these yellow eyes. I wasn't about to wait around to see what this abomination was going to do, so I got out of there. I left. Fast. I'm no track and field star, but I know I set a personal record for myself that day. I made it back to my truck in 13 minutes, threw all my gear in the back, and hauled out of there, going way above a safe speed. I didn't care about taking down my camp. I could always come back for my gear, too. I just wanted to get out of there. I eventually did go back to my camp at a later date, to see about packing my gear back out. But when I did come back, everything was decimated. My tent had been torn apart. The food I'd brought had been eaten or thrown about all over the place and the miscellaneous items I had, like books to read, had also been ripped to shreds. I honestly have no idea what I experienced. If it was a skinwalker or a wendigo, I don't know. I thought they were only in places with a big Native American influence. But I do believe it's possible for them to exist in Louisiana. We did have our own Native American tribes, after all. Or maybe it was the Louisiana Rougarou. Just a messed up and weird version of one. Who knows? One thing I do know is sometimes when I visit home, I'll see this deer. One that looks a little sick, staring at me through the edge of the woods. Sometimes part of me wants to go back in, hunt this thing down and kill it. But as far as I know, it hasn't hurt anyone yet. Maybe I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But the way it looked at me the way it bared its teeth and growled. Well, seemed to me it wasn't there to have a friendly conversation. I just feel lucky to be alive. Torn and Empty From Landon F. Growing up in Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia, you hear of these unnatural encounters and sightings quite often. I've always been skeptical of these sorts of encounters, and I always figured it was just people seeking attention, people wanting to tell something interesting. I've been an avid deer hunter since the time I could hold my own weapon, spending hours in the woods multiple times a week all throughout the season. I figured if things like this did exist, I would have seen for myself by then. My opinion has now been changed forever. The property we spent the most time hunting at had no phone service. It was around 30 minutes from the nearest town, which was Gate City, Virginia. Once we arrived at the property, we had free range of around 700 acres. That includes dense woods, pastures, and several cut four-wheeler trails. My family, who had hunted this property for years before I was born, had never had any strange encounters at this place. I never imagined something would happen to me. It was late November and rifle season was in full swing. We arrived at the property around 5 a.m. and we started to gather our gear for the morning hunt. We only had one four-wheeler at the time, so my grandfather took me to drop me off first and he planned to go back for my dad. He took me to a spot that had an old rotten tree stand that had not been hunted on for over 30 years. He told me how to get to the stand. Go straight up the ridge and hit that old logging road, and it'll take you right up there to it. You can't miss it. Meet me right back here about 12 to grab some lunch. Listening to him, I made it there without an issue. I sat down, still over an hour until daylight. I started to play a game on my iPod Touch. I was about 13 at the time and I was trying to find a distraction from the fact I was in the middle of the woods alone. Daylight soon broke and I noticed something. There were absolutely no sounds. I could hear my heart beating in my chest, an eerie feeling came over me, and the rest of the morning hunt I felt this way. I never saw anything, never heard anything. 
I was ready to get out of there. I walked back down the ridge and waited for my papa. He finally showed up, and we went to lunch at the closest diner we could find. The landowner was actually at that diner as well. We got to talking about where I was hunting, and he instantly showed a worried look on his face. He said, just be careful up there. My dad built that stand years ago and only hunted it a few times. For some reason, he never went back, never would tell me why. I'd brushed off what he said by the time I got back into the woods for the evening hunt. Everything seemed normal this time. The birds were chirping and the squirrels were running wild. A couple of hours went by when I began to hear footsteps coming towards me. The closer the steps got, the quieter the remainder of the forest became. With my experience in hunting, I knew without a doubt the walking I'd heard was a deer. I ignored the strange silence as the deer came into view. I pulled up my rifle, took aim, and fired. I knew I hit the deer, so I waited until right before dark to track the deer down, and dark was only a few minutes away. Darkness came, and still ignoring that silence, I began my attempt at tracking down the buck. I got on the trail with ease, but I had the feeling something was off. I finally spotted the deer in the distance, and the sight was something I would have never imagined. The deer was torn nearly in two, no blood around it, no internals left, no signs of what had happened. What could have done this in those few minutes before dark? As I got closer to the deer, I began to hear soft, slow-moving footsteps coming towards me, which stopped moving every time I stopped. I was frantically shining my flashlight all around, but I found nothing. I began to run towards the deer, grabbing it by the horns, and I took off running, dragging that deer behind me. Then I heard something that sounded like the woods being torn down behind me, and I swear I heard a voice too, a grumbling voice that spoke, That's not yours. In complete shock, I continued running down the hill with the deer. I could hear the four-wheeler in the distance then, so I let go of the deer, and I began to shine the light towards my papa. Before I made it to the bottom of the hill, this thing let out a scream that put chills down my spine. It almost sounded like the squeal of a pig, but very, very deep. Not gonna lie, I didn't think I'd make it out of the woods that day. My papa finally pulled up, and with my eyes full of tears and in my terrified state, I told him what happened. He started up the hill with his rifle and flashlight. The woods were silent still. About ten minutes passed, and I saw him coming down the hill with only the front half of my deer. My papa was moving fast, and without saying a word, he began to load the deer on the back of the four-wheeler. Before we pulled away, we heard the scream again. We never drove that four-wheeler so fast before. We haven't talked about this in years, but I will never forget it. Nothing else ever happened to me since, and we continue to hunt that property. But for some reason, I still have hopes to see what creature was stalking my prey that day. Dogman Stole My Fish From Rainbow Trout 55 Wyoming, the least populated U.S. state, nonetheless one of the most beautiful and drastic landscapes, from rolling hills and sagebrush to thick forests with mountains, rivers, and streams. That's where I call home. I grew up on my family's ranch outside of Cody. A little bit about myself, I'm six foot four and 220 pounds. Close family calls me farm boy because of my size. I take that as a compliment. After all, Luke Skywalker from Star Wars was called farm boy, and Luke is amazing, so take that, Grandpa. My favorite hobby is fly fishing. Nothing is more exhilarating than watching your fly get swallowed by a trout. Wyoming, in fact, is world-class and known for fly fishing. My favorite river to fish is the Snake River. It's a little bit of a drive to get to my favorite spot, but it's worth it. My terrifying encounter happened back in 2013. I was 19 at the time. It was in late summer, July, to be exact, around 3 in the afternoon. 
Trust me, I remember after this incident. To get to my spot, you have to take a dirt road three miles inward. Then you get to this little pull-off and you park. Then you have to walk about half a mile more into the woods. To be honest, I have no clue how my dad found the spot. But let me tell you, it's loaded with rainbows. You come out of the woods onto this shore and there's the river. It's about 30 feet wide and on the far side is fastish moving water. There are many slow and deep pools towards my side that are perfect for fish. For those of you who are new to fishing, the slower moving pools are where fish like to hang out because they're being lazy and are basically waiting for food upstream to drift downstream right to them for an easy meal. Since it was three in the afternoon, it was pretty warm outside, so I didn't put on my waders and I walked right into the nice cool water. I then started to cast. I had my fishing glasses on so that the glare wasn't as bad on the water. Here's where things start to get wacky. I had been fishing this strip of the river for about 45 minutes when I cast again. All of a sudden, I heard a tree fall from the other side of the river with a loud crash. It scared the bejesus out of me as I was that focused on the river. The river isn't as loud because at this section the water isn't moving as fast, so keep that in mind. I looked in the direction of that crash, and there I saw it. A jet black haired animal slowly walking down to the river. At first glance, I thought it was a black bear, but after further inspection, I realized it wasn't a bear but a large black dog. Another thought came to mind, as I thought it was a Yellowstone black wolf, but again I ruled that out because the size was too big. Then it really came into view, and my mind went blank. It came out of the trees onto the far bank and stopped. It looked at me. It had the most beautiful yet horrifying amber eyes that stared into me. It had a wolf-like head with sharp teeth. It was very well built, very defined through its fur. It had skinnier legs, but they were dog legs and still defined. Its arms were lanky and had hands that ended in sharp claws. That was the scariest part. I even remember taking off my glasses and rubbing my eyes to see if I was looking at a real thing. The wackiest part was that it walked and just sat patiently on the opposite bank, just like a house dog, watching me fish curiously. I was so astonished and confused, I forgot my line was in the water. Then its ears perked up as a giant trout took my fly with a splash. It looked at me, then at the line, then at me, then the line again, as if waiting for me to do something. I'm not sure why I didn't just run. I don't know why I didn't feel threatened at the moment. But that dog-man thing just sat there watching me curiously. It didn't seem to mean any harm. I quickly reeled in that fish. It was huge. I grabbed the fish and unhooked the fly. I was about to release it when the dog-man growled a deep growl. It's hard to describe with words. I froze as I saw it stand up on two legs and start to wade through the water towards me, like some person. I started to quickly move to my side of the shore when it did a short but loud grunt and pointed its claw at the fish in my hand. There were so many thoughts going through my head that I quickly ran out of the water and onto the shore, dropping the fish on the ground. I backed away towards the forest, my hands up, I even remember saying, it's all yours, like four times. The dog man crossed the river. It went to my now flopping fish and picked it up with one hand. It looked at me like, really dude, you got my food dirty. It then put its claw through the fish's gill and out the mouth, just like a person would do. It went back into the river with the fish now hooked in its claw. It put it in the water and moved it back and forth. It was washing it off. It then put it into its mouth and got back onto all fours, crossing the river again. It looked back at me one more time, taking the fish out of its mouth and giving it a little wiggle, taunting me as it then ran back into the woods. I sprinted to my truck, threw my gear in the trunk, and sped home. I got pulled over, unfortunately. I told the officer everything and he let me go with a warning, seeing I was in a panicked state. 
I told my family. They were astonished, but they ultimately believed me. This, hands down, has been the craziest, most unnatural thing that has ever happened to me. I still go fly fishing, but I've never and will never go back to that spot. Remember that some things in this world are unnatural, and you never know what might happen. Werewolf of Lake Monroe From Danny Joe My brother and I went on a fishing trip to Monroe Lake in Indiana. We've been there hundreds of times, and we've been all over the place. We left on a Friday morning and got there Friday late afternoon. We brought a john boat and some basic essentials, like a tent, my gun, and some firewood. We didn't bring much food. We thought we would just eat fish and some small game if needed. We loaded everything into the boat and took off before it got dark. The only lights we had were the ones on the boat and a small flashlight. After being on the water for about an hour, we found a small cove perfect for us because it was out in the middle of nowhere so we could do anything we really wanted. We unloaded the boat and set up camp. My brother got a fire going and I started to fish because I was hungry. After a few minutes, I realized there were no sounds at all from any directions, not even crickets, and I wasn't getting any hits whatsoever on my fishing rig. I gave up and started walking back to the camp, which was set up about 20 yards from the boat. When I got back to my brother, I asked him if he noticed the lack of nature sounds, and he replied, no, didn't pay much attention to it. And then we heard it, a loud howl that sounded like it was about a mile away. It sent chills down my spine. My brother began to shake. I was like, what the heck are we doing? We're both grown men. It was probably just a coyote. He agreed with a nod, and we both decided to lay down in the tent, calling it a night, but I got my gun out just to be safe, because that was really close. The next morning, we woke up and got the day started. We thought we'd go and see if we could find the footprint or scat trail from the coyote we heard last night. We ventured about half a mile into the woods from our camp. Before long, we found something. A very large and very dead coyote, which had been ripped apart. It was only two feet off the game trail. My brother was very interested in what could do this, but I was more interested in going back to camp. We got back to camp, and I went to my phone to text my dad. I asked what sort of big predators could take a coyote and do that to him, especially out here in Indiana. My dad replied, Can't think of anything more than a cougar, but that's unlikely. I figured it may have been another coyote fighting for territory. We decided to only stay one more night. Neither of us wanted to find this bigger coyote. So we went out on the boat for a while to go fishing, We'd had no luck in that cove. We made it to this rock face that we called our crappie honey hole, because we always caught crappie there. We started fishing and didn't stop until the sun began to set. We were both hungry, and so we called it a good day, and started to head back to camp. This little boat didn't go very fast, but it was better than a canoe or kayak. By the time we got back to camp, it was dark and the moon was high. It was very quiet again, so we slid the boat on the bank and made our way to try to start a fire in the fire pit to cook some of our catch, but we soon discovered that our campsite looked like a war zone. Everything was torn up, thrown around, like someone was looking for something or somebody. We both grabbed our guns and took the safeties off, then looked at each other with the same expression. Time to go. We didn't even grab anything. Just as we started making our way to the boat, we heard a deep and gurgling growl out in the distance. As we got to the boat, my brother grabbed a flashlight. He pointed it towards the camp. Like that, we both stopped, terrified, trembling all over. The light revealed two big yellow eyes about five feet off the ground. I started backing up. My brother jumped in the boat and started the motor. I followed him but I didn't want to take my eyes off whatever this thing was. As I climbed in the boat, I looked away for just a second. When I looked back up, it was gone. We got about 20 yards out into the water, and I used the light again to look for that creature. 
Then, I saw those same eyes coming out of the darkness. They began to come to the edge of the water. This thing looked like a wolf, but not exactly. It walked over to the water on all fours, but once there, it stood up on two legs. It reached a height of over six feet. We then heard it howl. I pointed the flashlight right at it then. It looked as if it had a piece of our tent clutched in its hand or paw. I moved my brother out of the way. I put the throttle on high, even though the part of the lake we were at was idle zone only. But we had to leave as quickly as we could. We got back to the boat ramp area, and we got the boat loaded on the trailer. Then we booked it. We didn't talk one bit all the way home, and we never said anything to mom or dad, though I'm sure they were wondering where the heck our tent and cooler went. I'm in my 30s now. I haven't been back to Monroe Lake since. To be honest, I'm scared to, and I warn people who are going there to be very careful. Labor Day Monster from Danielle B. This took place when I was only 15 in a small town called Cleveland, Oklahoma. I lived in the country of that small town. It was Saturday of Labor Day weekend, and my brother and I had just finished eating dinner with our parents. I was helping my mom clear off the table when she asked, I wonder how busy the lake is. My brother replied, I'll drive down and take a look. He also asked if I wanted to tag along. I replied, sure, why not? I put on my shoes and we got in my brother's car. Then we took off to the lake. Eventually, we made it to the old makeshift bridge, which was basically a big round tube cut in half after a small creek with gravel placed over it. There were no railings on either side. We noticed someone or something then crouching down as if playing with that gravel. My brother slowed the car down. At first, I thought it was a hunter due to the time of the season. But when I realized that this person wasn't wearing a vest that reflected light, as hunters are supposed to wear when hunting at night, I knew something was off. This would have been noticeable because of how dark it was getting. This thing had thick arms, and even though it was crouching down, it had to be at least six feet tall. I couldn't see any clothes on this creature, and as we approached, it stood up and turned towards us. That's when I really realized how big it was. I'm talking seven or eight feet tall and very hairy. It had no neck and very long arms and legs. What was very noticeable were its eyes. It had very dark red eyes reflecting from the car lights. At that moment, it stepped to the left into the thick bushes on the right side of the road. And as we crossed the bridge, my brother was driving very slowly so we could see where that thing went but we couldn't find it. My brother continued to drive. That's when I asked, what was that thing? He replied, I don't know, maybe a hunter. I told him, it couldn't be a hunter. Whatever it was was not wearing any clothes. I didn't see any vehicles around either. Hunters usually parked their cars on the side of the road where the woods were. We drove for a few more minutes and eventually made it to the lake. There were a lot of people at the lake, and the majority of them were camping and having fun. My brother then said, Let's go back to the bridge. Let's see if that thing came back. Are you sure? I replied. What if it decides to go after us? My brother turned the car around then, and we went back to the bridge. Honestly, I wasn't expecting we'd see it again. Sure enough, just like before, when we came back to the bridge... The creature was in the middle of the bridge, crouched down, messing with the gravel. And like before, it stood up, turned around, peered at us, then stepped to the side of the road. As we passed, we drove slowly again, trying to see where it was, what it was. Not seeing it, my brother turned into a driveway, backed up, and parked on the top of the hill that overlooked the bridge. He then turned off the car. At that moment, I asked him, What are you doing? I want to see if it comes back, he said as he watched the bridge. 
We both stared for a good 20 minutes. But nothing happened. My brother then turned the car on, and we went back home. When we got inside the house, I told my parents what we saw. My dad laughed, because he doesn't believe in that kind of stuff. My mother asked my brother, Is that really what you saw? My brother answered, That's what it looked like. If anything, I guess it was just a hairy person running around. At that moment, I grabbed the house phone. I then went into my room to call my boyfriend, to tell him what I saw, and at least he believed me. I haven't yet seen again whatever I saw that night, and I haven't told anyone for years until I met my now husband. Warning. The following story contains depictions of violence against pets. It chased me. From Anonymous. I do admit I didn't want to share this before, but my friend convinced me to share my story. This event made me never want to ride my bike at night, and by bike I mean a Suzuki GSXR 600. It was April 2023 when I was helping one of my friends who practically lived in the woods. I had only believed in ghosts before this. I have experienced encounters with those. However, what I encountered in this story was no ghost. This was a physical being. Now, for the story, you can call me Doru. My friend called me on my night off and said, Hey Doru, would you mind coming over and helping me look for my dog? He ran off earlier, still hasn't come back. I could hear the stress in his voice. I sighed and answered, I told you to keep him on a leash. His dog was a Rottweiler and Pitbull mix, but she was a big softie. She thought she was a lap dog. I got dressed, grabbed my jacket and helmet, took my bike out of the shed, and locked everything up. I hit the road and Jay's house was not far from mine, about two to three and a half hours away. I always took this quiet little road that I enjoyed riding down. But that night, I could feel something watching me. I didn't know from which direction the eyes watching me was coming from, so I sped up. Still, I could feel eyes on me. It was then I caught a quick glance of something black as the night. I accelerated faster, and whatever it was seemed to be keeping up with me. I sped up for a second time. That's when I saw blue eye shine. What kind of animal has blue eye shine? Just as quickly as I saw them, they disappeared, but that feeling remained. I didn't stop until I reached Jay's house. He was waiting for me outside with flashlights in hand. I told him to open the garage so I could put my bike in. Usually I leave my bike outside, but as soon as I pulled up, that feeling of being watched intensified. I kept my helmet on, and Jay asked, You okay? I, I just feel like I'm being watched. I even asked him for one of his pistols before we headed out. We went in different directions to search for the dog. I had the pistol drawn with a flashlight in my other hand. I kept going until I found a trail, as if something big and heavy had been dragged. I followed it, and that feeling of being watched intensified. I kept looking side to side, regretting not taking off my helmet. I wasn't paying attention to the ground until I stepped in something. It was thick and dark. It was then we found his dog. She'd been attacked and killed by something. I quickly grabbed her collar. That's when I heard growling like when you take a dog's food away while it's eating. I looked around with the flashlight, pistol ready. I found the source of the growl. This thing was tall, over seven foot three, maybe seven foot seven. It was covered in black fur with a head that resembled a massive dog's. But it was standing on two legs, and its arms seemed too long. I followed its arms down to its hands, each of them having three main fingers and a thumb, with long, dark claws. They were dripping with something. No, wait. That had to be blood, I realized. I snapped back to its face when it growled again. I raised the pistol and aimed it right at it. 
It took a step forward, opening its hands up. I fired off two rounds, but I couldn't tell if I even hit it because the creature didn't even react. I had no other choice. I turned and ran, and I won't lie, I think I soiled myself then. Whatever it was was right behind me. I yelled into the night air, Jay, run! He listened. The thing behind me must have thrown something at my head, but thanks to my helmet, the object bounced off. Jay, being much closer, made it to the house first. He opened the back door for me, screaming at me. I turned for a moment to see if it was still following me. It was, and it was running on all fours. I swear then I thought that thing was smiling. I ran quickly inside, Jay slamming the door behind me and locking it. What in the world was that? He asked. I got off the ground and ran to all the doors and windows. Only then did I take off my helmet. To my horror, there was a gash in the back of it. That was almost my head. I then heard something. Jay, quiet. Listen. We could hear heavy breathing outside. Jay then noticed the blood-soaked collar I still had in my hand. There was a mixture of fear and rage in his expression. Something subconscious told me to turn around, and I did. At a nearby window, that thing was looking in with a big, toothy grin. Jay grabbed a shotgun, trembling, but the creature backed away, disappearing into the dark. I stayed the night, unable to sleep because of the sounds of footsteps around the house. Just as dawn approached, we heard a massive howl that sent chills down my spine. Then we heard footsteps running away from his house. Still, I didn't leave until the sun was up. Jay kept his shotgun with him all night. I gave him the collar, and he cried. I felt so bad for him and his beautiful, kind dog. In the morning when I drove home, I had him watch me until I was out of sight. And I didn't take that road home. I took a different road, going full speed, not stopping for anything. Miraculously, I managed not to get pulled over. After that night, I bought a car, got a gun permit, and a concealed carry license. A warning to my fellow motorcyclists, don't go down any dark forest road in the middle of the night. Wait until day or go in a group. Whatever you do, don't do what I did. Make sure you're not being followed by glowing blue eyes. If you are, do not stop. Light in the Woods From Bobbert De Niro It was winter break of 2022. I came home after a long semester of college. My home, my old home, as we've since moved, was on the south shore of Massachusetts. My friends and I were all 20 years old. Every night we would hang out at our buddy's house, but on the night in question he was working the closing shift because he decided to work instead of going back to school. I don't remember the time. It was winter though, so it meant the sun was gone by dinner time. So to kill some time before our friend got off work, we decided to take a walk in the local woods. We were about a mile and a half from our cars, deep in the woods, on a set trail that led to a small lookout tower about three-ish miles in. As we walked, we noticed the sound of the wind had just vanished all at once. I mean, it was there one second blowing, and the next, no sound, even though the trees continued to sway side to side. We stopped and looked at each other. One friend, A, said to the other friend, G, and to me, You don't hear anything, right? G responded, yeah, this is weird. Like, I can feel the wind on my face still. A said, something's wrong. As for me, I'm not much of a talker, more of an observer. As my friends discussed the strangeness of the situation, I spotted a strange faint bluish light coming from about five yards in the thick brush to our right. Hey, do y'all see that? I asked. Yeah, what is that? My friends replied. 
I don't know. You guys want to check it out? My curiosity was getting the better of me. I, I mean, sure. Uh, we got time to kill, G said. I began to walk into the snow-covered brush. We got no more than five feet towards it when the light vanished. I mean, poof, gone. Huh? Maybe it was a reflection of the moon, A said. We agreed and turned around to continue our journey to the tower. But as we turned, the trail was gone. Just more woods. There weren't even footprints of ours, which would indicate where the path had been. All we could find were the footprints leading to our location now. Where's the trail? A asked. What the heck? G said. We stood there a solid minute, trying to locate any sign of the path, but we found nothing. Still no sounds either, other than our voices. Let's just go back the way we came. Maybe we just can't see the path yet, I said. The others nodded and we began to walk. Five-ish minutes passed, much longer than it took us to walk off the path originally, and yet there was still no sign of the trail. But then every crunch of the snow we made seemed to echo. Not a normal echo either. This echo came a few seconds after we made the sound. At one point, A tapped me and indicated to look at my phone. I looked, and a text read, I think we're being followed. Now, keep in mind, A is a true outdoorsman. He walks with no shoes on. As long as there was no snow, he can use his toes to grip. You should see the way he climbs a rope. We have a joke that he himself is a cryptid. So when A says something is up, then something is up. I looked at him, and he said, Let's just walk until we find any path. And that's what we did. God only knows how much time passed before we finally found something that even resembled a path. That being a few feet of space between trees and brush. All while probably being followed. Relieved, we started to walk on the trail, knowing we would find a trail marker showing our way back to our cars soon. As we got on the trail, the sound of the wind suddenly came back, and that weird echo, as I called it, stopped. It wasn't long before we found a specific rock that let us know our location, and we passed it. Several yards ahead, A said quietly, Look at that rock. We turned and looked. It did appear normal at a glance, but the more we focused on it, the more we could make out a bluish light coming from behind it. This light lowered before suddenly a dark canine shape arose. The shape had yellow eyes, and they stared at us. I instantly felt warmth filling my body and fear. The odd canine creature turned around and began to walk away. It stopped, turning to look at us as if defeated. It disappeared in the thick, dark woods. We all looked at each other with looks of fear, confusion, and relief. We immediately walked back to our cars, agreeing to never bring it up to anyone else in our friend group, out of fear of not being believed. We still don't want to talk about it. We also never went back to those woods, but a part of me feels a calling to return, and only at night. Something in the Woods from Anonymous. This is my own experience, which took place at my grandmother's. My grandma lived in a small house, surrounded by and in the middle of the woods. I would hunt deer and squirrel in those woods every year since I was 10 years old. I would stay the night with her too, going out every morning before the sun would come up and return after sunset. I've always felt comfortable and at home in those woods. After I turned 19, it had been two years since I'd last been out there to go hunting. A couple of my friends and I, Mike and Tim, decided to go out there to paintball. We left Tim's house and got to the woods about half an hour before dark. We decided one of us would go into the woods first, then after five minutes, someone else would go in. I went first, finding a good spot to sit at and wait. A few minutes later, 
I see Tim walk in and take a seat. Then after that, Mike walked in a little ways, making his way down the hill. After a couple of minutes, Tim noticed me and motioned me to come to him. I made my way down the hill I was on and we decided to team up on Mike. Tim would make his way down the hill where we saw Mike go and bring him back while I waited. Then I would unload my paintball gun on him. It's messed up, a jerk move for sure, but we were teenagers. We did this kind of stuff to each other all the time. So I sat there next to a large tree that had fallen over, waiting for them to come back. It felt as if I'd been sitting there for ages. It was starting to get dark too. At that point, I could only see about 50 feet in front of me. As I sat there watching towards the bottom of the hill, I heard something coming from my left and it began to move its way behind me. Now I thought that they had decided to get me instead. I'm 5'10", 220 pounds. They're roughly the same size. But what I was hearing sounded bigger and on two legs. I slowly turned around, only to see trees and darkness. I tried to focus beyond that, but it was useless with the lack of light. As I heard the footsteps get closer, I began to think to myself, they're not going to shoot me first. So I slowly pulled up and started to unload my paintball gun in the direction I heard the steps. When I finally ran out of paintballs, Mike and Tim showed up in the opposite direction. They asked me what the heck I was shooting at. I told them what happened and said that I never heard it leave either. So the three of us left in a hurry, wondering what in the world was out there that was as big as a person, maybe bigger, and walked on two legs, but wasn't one of us. We haven't been back to those woods since. Wendigo Encounter in Maine From Duke of Caprisan I was born and raised in the state of Maine, and I am of Penobscot and Abenaki descent. The story I'm about to tell you took place in the town of Farmington, Maine, along the Sandy River. While at college in Farmington, my friends and I would go down to the banks of the Sandy River to smoke, drink, and have some campfires. One night, we decided to do just that. I went down to the laundry room and collected lint from the dryers to aid as a fire starter. I knew we would struggle to light the fire as it had snowed recently and most of the kindling in the woods would be too wet to light. Additionally, I was always given the task of lighting those fires when we had them as everyone else always struggled and I just seemed better at lighting them. Once we gathered everything together that we needed, we all headed down to our usual spot overlooking the river and we started to collect firewood. The moment we got down to the overlook, I was instantly feeling unsettled, almost like I was being watched from every possible direction. I took note of the feeling, and I decided to keep an eye out for anything else that was unusual. In general, I am very trusting of my gut instincts, as they are usually right. While everyone else collected firewood, I knelt down, and I started trying to light the lint in the ring of stones we always used. Suddenly, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end, and below me, along the frozen beach, I heard footsteps. They sounded heavy, like what a moose or a cow sounded like, walking through crunchy snow. I asked my friend, Ian, Did you hear that? He just looked at me, confused, shaking his head. I couldn't just shake it off. I knew something was wrong. Then the smell hit me. It was sickly sweet, overlaid with the scent of dead flesh, like a dead raccoon in a hot dumpster full of rotten apples. I looked around, trying to determine if anyone else was smelling it. Then, something said my name in a voice that was a combination of radio static and tinfoil being crinkled up. In a split second, I put everything together. That uneasy feeling of being watched, the unidentified footsteps, the smell of rotten fruit and death, and that voice calling my name. I had heard stories of the Wendigo my entire life. My grandfather always cautioned me about it, but I was never sure whether I believed in it or not. 
The moment I realized what was going on, I closed my eyes and pressed my face into the snow in front of me. I could hear my friends asking me if I was okay, but they sounded like they were shouting down a long hallway. Then the voice spoke again. Look at me. It almost sounded like my grandfather, but I knew better than to respond to it. I lay down in the snow, my eyes shut tight, until the footsteps and the smell disappeared. Finally, I sat up and looked around carefully, keeping my eyes on the ground until I saw my friends circling around me. I could finally hear them calling out to me. We have to leave now, I told them. I guess I sounded sure enough that they didn't even question it. We walked in silence back to the dorms. Once we got inside, Ian pulled me aside and asked what happened. I didn't want the Wendigo to follow me, so I said I just felt like something was watching us and that I was afraid something bad was about to happen. I didn't tell anyone about the encounter until I moved to another town. None of my friends ever heard or smelled anything, so I think it was targeting me because it knew that I knew what it was. Thanks for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us in a number of other ways. You can go to eeriecast.store to buy some creepy t-shirts or coffee mugs. Go to eeriecast.com to listen to and follow this show and our other scary podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Or follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails for more screams and memes. Before I go, be sure to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.